Uh, we're going to start this morning talk a little bit about zone attacking zones and one of the things that I that I believe in is that if you analyze what a zone actually is and what they're trying to do with it it's been my experience that I find that after the first pass, almost every zone, no matter what the original front of it looks like, is they become the same. For example, if you make a pass to the wing against a 2-3, this is basically what it looks like with four guys on the strong side and one on the weak side. That's basically what you're going to get out of a 2-3. The same thing is true out of a 131 when the 131 rotates. You can see as he walks through, when you pass to the wing, the zone is really basically the same thing. It's the same basic thing, I think, out of a 122. Did we put that on there, Robert, or didn't we? Yeah, here's a 122 or a 32. Once you make a pass to the wing, all three of these zones look alike. And I think. If, if you recognize that, then it makes uh, uh, pretty apparent of what you have to do to beat these zones. I think the first thing, once you recognize this, then it's important that you, you, you see that, that the toughest part of, in attacking the zone is getting a shot on the, on the strong side, but where the zone is really vulnerable is on the weak side. So what you have to do is devise ways to initiate the offense on one side and then get the ball back to the weak side where you have a numerical advantage. So it doesn't really make any difference what kind of front they give you. It's always going to be the same, almost almost identical, once you make your initial pass to the wing. What's next on there, Robert? <laughs> okay, let's start out by... Uh, if you can get the ball in the middle against any zone, what you've done is eliminate a zone will end up with four guys on the side of the ball and or three and a half and one on the weak side. But if you can get the ball in the middle against the zone, now you've taken away their advantage because they can't then overload one side or the other and create a, a, a defensive advantage for them, which is what they're trying to do. So first thing we do is start again, Robert. We put we put our basic lineup in a balanced attack. I used to start 1-3-1. One, one. Uh, but I found that it was it made it easier for the zone to overshift whichever side you had your baseline man. So we decided that if we started it balanced, then it would keep the zone balanced. And if you put your baseline people, these two down here, if you put those two behind the zone, then it made it easier to get them open when they break up in there because the defense is watching the ball and they have to turn their head and they either lose sight of the ball or the man. So we, we start our, our post players low. And then what we're trying to do here is, is break somebody up into the center. And if you can throw the ball in there, now Robert shows them surrounded there, which is fine, but what we've done then is once we get the ball in the middle that we are still in a balanced situation. So then we rotate if the wingman to the baseline and we cross the man that was on the baseline underneath. So what you've got now is you've got, if you look at the baseline, you have a three on two situation, don't you? Now if you, you can move, if depending on your shooters, if you're if you're got if these players right here are three point shooters, you move them out to the way out to the baseline. But either way, when you cross that man underneath in the middle, you had two down at the baseline. Now when you cross him underneath, I'm talking. That's right, that guy right there. You make one of those people underneath take him, and if he takes the if if the one on this side takes him, then when you throw to the, you throw to the baseline on this side. If you, same thing's true on the other side. If the other low man, the forward, defensive forward, takes the middle man coming across, then you throw to the other. So you've created, with the, by passing the ball into the middle, 
you you froze the zone in the middle and now you are attacking the baseline obviously if you don't have baseline shooters that isn't going to work is it? so i guess you have to start with that but what we're trying to do in this simple little by making one pass into the center is to attack the baseline we've got a three on two situation there now obviously you're not going to be able to get this ball in the zone. The other, the other factor uh, in the middle all the time, back it up, uh, Rob. The other factor is, is that there is a difference between a 2-3 two, and a 2-1-2. Two, two. It's basically the same, the lineup is the same, but in reality what you have is if you, if the middleman, what I try to do is analyze who's going to cover the first pass. Robert, I'm going to walk up here for a minute, just for a second. See if I can do it better from here. All right. If if you make a pass to this wing, if this man here is going to take the first pass, then did we put this on computer where we slide him up or down? We didn't, did we? I don't think so. All right, so let's assume the first pass is going to come here. One of the most important things in attacking this zone is is to know if it's going to be if he's going to be covered by the baseline man or by this man. If this man is going to cover him, then you slide him down two or three steps. Now, the further he has to come to get this man, the bigger hole that it leaves here. So, the further this man has to come to help fill this void when you bring this man up into the middle and slide him across into here. So the further this guy has to go, the further this guy has to go to cover this spot, and that leaves them more vulnerable over here on the weak side. If the reverse is true, if this man is going to cover first pass, you slide him up the lane a little. Now the further he has to come, the more distance this, this man has to come to cover this side, and the further he has to come, now the further they have to get back when the ball's reversed. Does that make sense? That's rel relatively basic, but I, but I think it's important to... Where you position these wing players is very important, because what you're trying to do at attacking any zone, if, especially if you're going to score on a strong side, is you're gonna, you have to try to create gaps. Well, the bigger the gap you can create, the easier it is to get the ball in there which is where you want to get it anyway. The reason people play zone, or one of the reasons, is that they're trying to overload where the ball is so that you can't get shots on the strong side. Okay, we got the ball in the middle. Now we've got three on two on the baseline. And it's just a matter of recognition. If, if, they're, if this center does not come up and take this man, if the center slide, if he stays deep in here, this guy turns and shoots a shot. If he comes up on him, now he's got the option of throwing there, and then this guy slides across, he can dump it in, or he can throw there. If they don't cover him, he just makes a little bounce pass and throws it up by the rim to the man in the middle. So you really, with, by throwing the ball into the center, you have a three-on-two situation on the baseline. All right, let's move on. We, we use what we call a continuity type of attack that, that it works on the same way on either side. Well, we usually try to start the offense on the side where the low post man is. So if, one of the, if this man breaks up into the middle from, the, from that side, that's where we're looking. But if he can't, we can't throw the ball in there, he's going to hit the wing man on the right side. All right, now here's what I talked about with gaps. He and this the guards covering the first pass. Okay, so when you take your center here and slide him into the gap, that forces this man to come, or it forces this man to come up to cover him. Alright, so what we've done here is we break this guy out on the baseline, and if we can't throw it in here directly, then we'll hit the baseline man. Now as we hit the baseline man, we're going to run this diagonal cut right through to the baseline. The reason we're going to do that is two reasons. One, we want to occupy that center. If the center doesn't take him, we're going to drop the little bounce pass right down in there on the baseline to the cutter on the diagonal. 
But the further he has, the center has to go over to cover this guy, run him on down in rubber. All right, see how big a gap we've got here? So you can then slide this guy down in here, or if you bounce pass it in to him, you've got him going to the basket, and you can make that pass from the baseline man into the center coming down the lane. So what we've created here by running him two to the baseline, and that center has to take him, and that leaves a bigger gap in the middle, and that's where we're trying to attack. All right, let's, move, uh, let's assume now that we can't get the ball in there. <laughs> that we're going to take our center, and we're going to pop him out here on the wing, and we're going to reverse the ball to him. Now, this is the reason I like to use a center in that situation. Oh, good, a pointer. Somebody broke my car antenna. <laughs> Okay, so as he, he goes down to the baseline and the ball's here, we can't get it into the middle, which sometimes you can right in here. Then he reverses the ball to the center, pop it out. Now, I like to use a center or a big man because it makes it easier for him to put the ball up high and make the overhead pass because remember the first thing we talked about is that you've got to figure ways to get the ball back to the weak side where you have a numerical advantage. All right, so as he reverses the ball to here, the zone is still on this side of the floor. Now, whether this man's here or here or here, it doesn't really make any difference. There's still four on this side and one on the weak side. Now, our guard, when he makes the entry pass to the wingman, before he cuts through, he hits the baseline, he pops, throws the ball back here. So this, this is our forward here, this is our center, this is our other center, forward, it doesn't matter. All right, now, what we're looking at here is throwing the ball, we take our guard and run him opposite. And the reason we do that is because we want to now get as many people on this weak side as we can. Alright, so what we've done is we'll throw, if you have a big man here, he can take and throw that skip pass across there a lot easier than you can with a smaller man. So that you say, well, you got your center clear out here. Yeah, but we're not shooting the ball. What we're doing is using him to pass the ball. So as he passes across, this man here was on the baseline, right here. So as he reverses the ball here, as the pass starts across here, this man starts across, this guy starts right across the baseline, and he's going to down pick here. So he's going to come off this pick. So we throw the ball to the weak side. Now, as he comes around, we've got one, two, three on two, which is what you want when you get the ball back to the weak side. And what, so we've taken this guy and we screen down here with him right on the, on the low man, whoever it is on that weak side, which creates a three on one sometimes. Remember, this man here is still over here. He had to come all the way back over here to cover this guy. So you can throw across here, make your penetration, shoot the ball, kick it off here, throw it to here. If this guy fights his way out, you dump it inside. And you've, got, you've still got three on one or three on two on the weak side of the floor, which is what you're looking for anyway. Okay, what's next? Okay, now let's assume, yeah, let's just, oh, then the other thing is, once the, once the ball's in the middle, this guy here, he, this, this, the reversal man that threw it here, he's diving right back through the center here. That's where he's coming. So, when, so in reality, once the ball gets to him, here comes our guard, goes back opposite the ball. The guard threw the ball to him here. Now he's going back opposite. If he can't get it, he'll throw it back out here. That's a quick moving zone. When I draw it, I draw the offense beating the zone. <laughs> when he draws it, he draws the zone catching the offense. He's tough on me. All right, so we get, we get the ball back to the weak side and throw it here. Now you can... Throw the ball back across here, screen down here, bring him back across on the weak side. So either way, what we're trying to do is down pick on these fall, on these uh, baseline men, and that's you can run the same thing on both sides. Obviously, if you start it on your shooter's side, if this is your shooter, this wingman, when you initiate the offense, 
You're cutting him through. You're bringing him, your shooter, around the pick. Now, let's say, just for example, let's say this guy right here that set the screen. Move it back a little way, Robert. Let's say that this, this forward over here is a three-point shooter. Back further. All right, if, if this forward is, is a shooter lead you, and you want to rotate him down here for the three-point shot, when you rotate and throw across here and leave him out here, now when this, this man comes across, you, you can throw to this man on the, on, as your three-point shooter. If this guy's quick enough to get out here and cover him, you've got this guy coming back on the baseline, you dump it in that way. So it depends on what you're trying to exploit there. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Put the ball in the corner here. All right, put the ball in the other corner. All right, now there's, there's two ways you can do this. Let's say, for example, let's say he's got the ball here now. Okay, where'd this guy come from, Robert? Who is that guy? Oh, he's the screener. Okay, he's my screener. Okay, that's fine. Uh, he down screen, he came off the screen, and uh, he's got the ball in the corner. All right, now you can actually do this. You can dribble up to here, just dribble up a little bit, assuming this guy's got you and you're not open. And now, once he dribbles, if he dribbles to here, this guy can pop out on the baseline. You can hit him, run your diagonal through, just like you did on this side. This man can, or your guard here can go opposite. And then the man on this side who was out here, he down screens, and when the ball, this guy pops out, you throw across this way, and he comes around going the other way. So you can do it either way. If this man, you can do it like he's got it here on the weak side. You, when you make the pass, the guard goes opposite. And what we're trying to do there simply is get more men on the weak side of the floor because that creates your numerical advantage where you need it, on the weak side. Is that clear enough or not? Is that all right? All right. All right, go ahead. Move on. Okay. Now, here's the same zone. We're going to attack. Now, instead of attacking the baseline like we've been, now we're going to attack these two guys right here. There's a lot of different things you can do. One of the things we like to do is we like to screen these guys. We, we'll take and we'll break... <coughs> We'll hit the wing, and here comes the same man. He comes back up in here. All right, now he's going to back pick right here on this guy, on this guard who rotated over. If you pop him up here in the middle and slide him here into the gap, and this guard gets around in front of him or half front and just step behind him. Now when the guard goes opposite and you reverse the ball, this guy's got to take him. So what we've got here, as the ball comes across, we've got this center back picking the guard. So now we've got two on one on the weak side by back screen in this guard. Now you say, well, I wouldn't let my guard come that far over, okay? You leave your guard right there. When he breaks up into the middle, <coughs> you throw the ball here, you just throw it into him there. If this guy takes him, you flash this guy across, go to the baseline, and you're right back where you were when you got the ball in the middle. But that, this is why we take the guard and go opposite. But here, here's the next part. If, if you throw the ball to the wing, right here, go ahead, throw, and this guy stays away so you don't get this numerical advantage on the weak side, you screen inside of him. And then you just step right in here. And as this, this man takes the ball, you throw right here. So we screen either side of this guy. If, we, if, he, if he slides over, we screen behind and go opposite. If he stays weak side so we don't get that numerical advantage on the weak side, we'll screen inside of him, step the guard in, drop it right here. Then, if this guy fights around, you just step him there, you throw the pass here. Somebody's got to come up and take him. That leaves this man open. This guy crosses underneath. So you still got two or three on one on the weak side of the floor. And you did it simply by eliminating one of their defensive players from getting to an area that he's supposed to cover. Now, if he can't get there, I mean, somebody else got to come a lot further to get there to take that same spot. So, in this instance, we're attacking the front, the two guards. The other thing, like we talked about earlier, 
go back to the start. If this guy is going to cover this first pass, slide him down here a little bit. Now he's got a lot further to come, which means there's a lot more area right here, which is where you're trying to get the ball anyway, right in here. This guy comes up. You, you, he's going to have to come up a long way. If he comes up into here, you can roll this man down the middle. You can throw this pass here. Obviously, if he's in here, when he makes the pass to here, he's coming like this. So if this guy has to dive in here on him, he can make this pass to this forward. He can make the, throw the pass up. If this center has to come up and help to take this guy, he can throw it up to this guy right there. All right, let's go on. Okay, now let's. Now we're going to attack uh, a three-two or a one-two-two. And we're going to do it with the same offense, just to show you the versatility of it. Here we're looking to get the ball into the middle. <coughs> Anytime you can get the ball here to this man break it up, which there's obviously in this zone, there's a big hole there in the center. You've got the same exact situation. When the pass comes into this man, and when he's moving towards the ball, you can throw it up to him. So it's not too hard to get over this guy. If he's moving, and you just he, you might throw it to him right here instead of here. It just depends on he's going to slide right into the middle. Let's say you get the ball to him right here. All right, this man's going to cross. He's going to the baseline. He's going to the baseline. So what you have now is you've still got your same three on two down here. This guy can turn, penetrate, he can shoot the ball. He can dump it into this man crossing, or he can hit either either of the wingmen. So ideally, this is where you want that ball. All right, let's move on. All right, if you hit the wing. All right, now how, here's the zone again. It shifted. They got four guys on the strong side, one on the weak side. Just very basic thing. Like if you, you hit this man popping out on the baseline side. And now you run your diagonal. Now, now look, when you run him clear to the baseline there, did you see where the center has to come? Now this is the guy here that was over here. He had to come clear across here, and he has to get in front. If he just doesn't get in front, you throw it right in there on the post. You take him to the basket. If he, get, if he covers that, see the big gap that leaves right here? So with, with your man that came up here, he slides right down into here. You can hit this guy right here a lot of times, or if you make the pass there, there's a wide open lane to make this pass. If you get it in on the low post, he can hit him breaking right down the middle. All right. Now, if he doesn't get it, he pops out, throws it here. All right. Guard goes opposite. We reverse the ball. This man came across underneath. He down the screens here. He comes around the pick. And you now have your three on one or three on two on the weak side. So you're right back into where you were before. And you still have the option of getting the ball into the middle. You, you've got your continuity. You can reverse the ball. Break going through it, uh, Robert. All right, he just went opposite. The center popped out. Now he throws here. Now he's going to down pick here. We already did that. I'm sorry. He's, already, he's too quick. He already, he already down picked and he came around. Robert's quicker than I am. He's younger too. Okay. What's next? All right, let's attack a 1 3 1. Oh, you can attack this same 1 3 1 with that continuity. Now I'm going to show you an alternative attack for a one front zone that we use. Are attacking a one, whether it's a one two two or a one three one. As you can see, the way we we've lined up the offensive players, we have three guys down here against one. We've got two guards, and what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to create shots for my shooter. Now he can be here, here, and he can be outside the three-point lane depending on his range. 
and, and what kind of a shooter he is, but that's where we put our shooter. And what we're going to try to do in most 131s, this guy has baseline responsibility. Alright, so what we're going to do is penetrate into here on the dribble. This guard's going opposite. And what we're going to try to do is make these two men commit to take us. Now this guy probably would be out just a little ways here, which forces this man, because the ball right here, it forces him to stay out here. Okay? Now what we're trying to do here is to make the zone commit to this side. Now we'll step right here, back pick here, so we can then throw the ball back to this guard and then to your shooter. Or you can throw right from back here. And I, what I do here is use my big guard or a small forward, or even a big forward if he's a good ball handler, for two reasons. You throw this, you can make this pass with the back pick here. All right, run back a little bit, Robert. Back. Okay? You see, as long as he's here, if you move this guy out <coughs> just a little ways, then you got a big hole in here. And it forces this man here to stay inside. All right, so all you, he's real easy to backpick. So you make the penetration here and throw right to the shooter in the corner. All right, if this guy drops down here or drops back in here in this passing so you can't throw it, then you throw right here. Now, as he comes up to take this man, then you throw, you can throw to the corner either way. So you really, by making a penetration here, with two guards, and this, this, the, the good part about this offense is, is that what we're doing is we're taking advantage of their spacing, and we really have no continuity here. We're not, there's nothing really, you can teach this offense in 10 minutes. All you've got to do is learn, is, is, is get them to look and see the open man. So, see this guy right here? If this guy plays outside the pick, this guy can just flash. Now with him here, he's got to honor this man. So when the ball comes here, let's run it back just a little bit. So I'll shoot. Go further. Okay. You see this guy here? If this, this man plays on the top side of him, he can flash right into here. If this man plays uh, inside of him, he picks behind him, we throw over. So either way, we're working on that guy right there. All right, throw the ball. Now you can throw the ball all the way to the corner for the shot there, and then this guy slides back down, and you can dump it in here. If this guy comes across, you can reverse the ball, reverse it to here. And what you've done is you've created just an alignment without any movement that makes it really difficult for a one-guard front to cover. All right, go on through a little bit. Okay, well, all right. Okay, now, all right, let's, all right, here's what we call, we call this two flash. With this big hole in the middle, and you can throw it in there from either side, but when you bring this man up into the middle, in this, with this zone here, what you've done is you've left a big old hole right there. So you can throw it in here, or you can throw it in from here to this man flashing in the middle, and then you back door. Here. So you can make this pass. Is that what we did on there? Did you throw this pass? Oh, we just set it up. All right, back it up then. All right, you can throw it from either side. You can make the pass into here, or you can make the pass into here to this man break it up, and you see the big hole you leave? So when he goes back door, there's nobody over there to cover him. And you can make this pass here. You can turn. And leave this, this guard can stay right there, which keeps this man up. You can make your pass right back to your corner. So either way, you're screening here. If this guy gets on the top, you flash him across and throw it in here. So you, you, what you really got is three on two there, and you got one on none over here. Just simply by flashing him up and making this man cover it. And then you just rotate. All right? Yes, sir. He's, he's going to rebound it because we're going to shoot it. 
it's going up. I guarantee if you get the ball here or to your shooter over here, one of those, I mean, they've only got two guys down there. I mean, somebody's got to be open there. Okay, now, this is what we call our stack. And we use this. You can use it against a 1-2-2 two, two, or 1-3-1, one, one, or you can use it against the 2-3. And we show it here against the 2-3. And what we're trying to do here, as you can see by setting a double screen here, is we want to put the pressure on this guy right here. We're going to make him make a commitment, one place or another. If he stays where he is here, we're just going to screen him. We're going to make the penetration up into here to, to freeze these two, make them guard us, and then we're going to throw the ball right to my shooter right there in the corner. Now, he, if he's a three-point shooter, that's a big advantage. Now, you say, well, they're not going to leave this guy down here inside the pick. When is this guy going to be inside this double screen? Usually, if you bring the ball a little bit to this side. He'll always slide here. If he doesn't slide here, if he plays up on top, you can throw it up, just flash this guy to the basket, throw it up to him right here. All right, that's, all right we got the ball, that, when we pass goes uh, to the corner, all right, here he is on top. Run it back, okay? All right, now here's the two, the, now they've got this guy on top, okay? Now there's a number of things you can do, all right? You can back pick this guy right here, flash your center up for the low man up, and you can actually just pin him right there and you can throw it here to here to here, you can throw it directly to here. And if he fights around this pick, you throw right to your shooter over here. So no matter which way they go, you, you, he breaks up, you hit him here, you throw the corner. And he screams here. If he stays on the top side, you just pin him right there and throw it here and dump it in. Or you can dump it right straight in from there. Alright, go ahead. Now we got him up here on top side. And he's he's there so that he can't make this pass to your shooter over here. Alright, now there's a number of things you can do here. Let's say, for example, that I break this man up in the middle. The top man. Who's going to cover him? It's going to be this guy. And as he comes up, you just flash right there and throw your pass up there. If this man covers him down here and it plays good, then you throw to your shooter again over here in the corner. All right, now, let's, now we run what we call flash baseline. What we're trying to do here is we've still got the same... The same setup over there. Start back again so I can. <coughs> Alright, our pass now is going to go to this wing right here. And he's set down far enough when you're attacking the baseline that this guy has a hard time getting there. If we can make this man cover us, he's got to be in shooting range and deep. If we can make this man cover the first pass. Now you can see the possibilities. If he's out here covering the ball, you can see how many people. We got this guy flashing into the middle. We got this guy coming baseline. You can throw here. You can throw here and here. You can throw up to this man. You can throw directly in here. You can hit this guy right here if the center stays up. So what you've got, simply go back just a little bit. Because you've got three guys here against two already. You, you can always throw here and throw across with the pick here, but as soon as they, they flash, you've got one man coming baseline and one flashing into the middle here with only one center here to cover them. If this guy comes to cover here, then you throw up here. If this guy stays up, you throw here. Or you throw here and then flash him down the middle and dump it inside. So you've got three on two that you're looking at right there. And against the three, that's why it's important you make this guy take you. Now if you play up here and the first pass comes here and the guard takes you, now you have no numerical advantage down here. That's why when we started, I explained to you it's really important the positioning of this wingman. Because you can make the forward take you or you can make the guard take you as you, depending on where you're attacking. 
Just like we talked about when we're attacking these top two guys, you set him up here so he has to take him, and then when you screen the other one, you've got all the edge there. So the same thing's true when you're attacking the baseline. When you hit this man here, you want him deep enough that this forward has to take him, and that creates a three on two under here. All right? Is that all we did on that? <coughs> oh, okay. When, when this forward's out here, and you call baseline, he's going to come across. As you bring this man up, you freeze the center here. You make this center come and get him. Now you can actually take the ball and throw it. See if you back pick here with this other stack man. You can actually throw it up to this man coming across right here. But if this center stays back, you throw it to this one right here in the middle. Now if he comes across, who's going to take him? You throw the ball here, you throw it into him right there. If this guy dies back in here, you throw here. If he, he gets the ball here, if this guy takes him coming across, you throw here. Now if the center stays back, you just turn and shoot it. So no matter what they do, because of the of the, the three guys there, once you get the ball here in the middle, you have a big edge. Because you've got one, two, three, four against three. And that's, that's all you're really looking for. All right? All right, I, I want to use this for a second. Okay, the same stack that we've got right here. The most important thing is that these three here learn to work together. And it's, so, it's very simple because there's very little movement. What, what we're really trying to do here is, let's just say, for example, that I make my penetration right into here. I can take this center right here and, and just take him one or two steps right there and back pick and then actually throw up to that man. If, in fact, this guy is tall enough or good enough to get back in here on this guy so that we can't throw that pass to him, who should be open? Right here. Your shooter. Right there on the baseline. Because we already have three on two. This man here can go either way. He can, he can rotate up, and we'll run what we call a throwback, if, you want, if you're looking for a name. And anytime we need a, a quick basket or and we're looking for a three-point shot, if you like three-point shooting against that, you put your shooter right there, put your stack there. All right. We'll just take and break this man right up into the middle, up above the center man, and we'll throw this pass right here. And as he catches the pass, he turns this way. And now, if this center takes him, he can dump it right there. If, this may, if the defense is back in here, he throw what we call throwback, he throws right back to the corner. So you can get a, an unmolested shot. Of course, you still have to make the shots, but I mean, I make them every time on this four. I haven't missed one yet. I just wanted you to know that. So right there is what you're attacking. And you've got to, anytime you get it into the middle there, you freeze that zone, and, and then you're in great shape. A couple other things on the, uh, out of the stack that, we haven't covered on the screen here. Okay. Let's say, for example, I hit this forward over here. All right, he takes him. This guy right here is the key. If, if he slides over and he slides down in here, we're going to back pick him. And then we'll throw a cross right there. 
and we'll just back pick here and throw all the way across and we got and we shoot the ball from right there. We run what we call a stack pick. Alright, well we'll make the pass here, we'll slide him over to the ball side instead of opposite the ball, and as he throws it back out, we take this guy across, and back pick there and slide this man right into the middle at the same time. Okay, now what does that do? This guy comes across here calling for the ball. So as the pass comes back out to this guard, that freezes this center. And then this, when he makes a return pass, he comes off and we throw up for the dunk, hopefully. And it's a pass you have to practice, but you back pick here. If this center stays back in here and doesn't cover, then you just throw the ball right in here to this man. But if you splash him across there, I guarantee you that that's and look at him, that center will cover it. And then when you back pick here, just reverse and throw it up. Right there on the baseline. We call that back stack pick. That's just a, that's what we call it. You call it anything you want. But that's a good way to get a layup. And if we use this type of play, call play, like the throwback or the stack pick, when it, whenever it's in a crucial situation where you've been running continuity or you've been running your regular stack and you're looking and you, it's a situation where you need a basket. You want a high percentage shot and anytime you get a layup against a zone or a dunk against a zone, it's really demoralizing to the opponent and that's what we're looking for here. So we, we're looking for that particular layup right there. You can also You can do the same thing on this other side. You might start it here, slide over, get the return pass. As the return pass comes, you do this. You break your low man right up into the middle, which forces this center to take him, and you back pick this guy and bring him right there and throw up to him here. So you, you got the same basic type of play. The key is, is occupying this middle man and and because he's on top of the stack because he's afraid you're going to throw the ball here or if you throw it here and this guy slides inside like I said before we just double pick we back pick him there and throw across so either way you've got a big advantage but you can get the layup against the zone if you if you'll use some good screens and the, the beauty about screening the zone one of the things that, that that we do on defense and our man-to-man -man is we switch most of the time on screen. But in a zone, there's nobody there to switch with. If somebody picks you and you have an area to cover and you can't get there, there's nobody to help you. So a screening is, in reality, it's more effective against the zone than it is against the man-to-man. -man because they can't actually switch in a man-to-man. -man. In a zone, they can't. If you keep up someone from getting where he's supposed to get, for example, you want to create a little advantage against a one-man front. Let's say they're playing a 1-2-2 or a 3-2, two, two, whatever. What's wrong with doing something like this? Take your point guard with the ball, bring this guy up here, and screen this guy right here. Start in here, dribble. He comes from behind now. When he comes off this dribble, who's going to have to take him? This guy is here, isn't he? All right, now what's that leave right there? Does that not leave two on one over there? Here, let me do that again.
Okay, you start to dribble here, he comes up here, and he's going to back pick this guard. You reverse dribble off this pick, right to there. This man has to take him, or you've got the easy jumper right here. Now you have two on one there. You throw here for the shot. This guy is out there quick enough, you dump it in on the baseline right there. And as this guy picks, he's going to roll right back down the middle. Just like that. So you really, you've got two on one here or three on one. If this guy gets all the way, can get across there quick enough, then this roll man might not be effective. But one of these two is going to be open. Either these two here, when he's got the ball on that wing. You can do the same thing in reverse with the back pick. Let's say they're like this. When the pass goes to the wing, this guy rotates, he rotates over, he rotates here, and he rotates down. Okay, so they really, and this man drops back into here. So here's how they actually look now. Once they've rotated, they got some resemblance of this. That's how it is. All right? So once they get to that point, what's wrong with bringing this man up here and back picking that guy? All right, now let me show you the whole thing. The rotation, he came across, he came down. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, you pass to the wing, he rotates over, he's out, he's in here. So they're like this, and he has the backside. All right, so now, when you bring this man up into the middle, as this guy rotates down in here to cover the center, you screen behind him. Now remember, this, this man up here has got this whole backside. So when you rotate your guard opposite, you have a man out here, and you throw back across, the man that's supposed to cover this guy out here is being back screened. So you are sitting like this. This point guard dropped back in here and you're back picking him. So you're going opposite now. This man dropped back into here. Alright, so now when you throw back across, to this guard, you have this man and this man both against this one right here. So you've got two on one by picking behind the same guy we just picked on the other side of. So either way, you can throw all the way to the corner and slide this guy in here, throw here if this guy gets out there quick enough. But the beauty is, with the, just a simple little pick, either in front or behind, you can keep this guard from getting where he has to go to cover and create a two-on-one or a three-on-one or a three-on-two. And then it's just a matter of getting the ball in the basket, which is probably the hardest part anyway. Just a couple things about, about a press to start with. If, in fact... You, you don't believe in the press, let me say this to you. I think that there is a press that you can use, I don't care what kind of talent you've got. There are certain presses can be designed to do different things and take advantage of certain types of personnel. If you're all slow, that might go off. I, I think there's a press that you can use no matter what kind of personnel you have or no matter what type of game plan you have. I think it's important to understand that there is a press that can help your team win. I don't care what you do. If, you're, if you want to play the fastest game that this basketball has ever seen or if you want to slow the tempo down, there's a way to do it with the press. And you can take advantage of a lot of different situations. I, I like the press. And the basic reason I like the press is because, for me, the, the number one word in this game is tempo. There's no way you can practice two or three hours a day at what you're trying to do with your players and then get into a game 
where somebody else changes the tempo, the, the way you play, and expect to be as effective as you can be. And that's what, ha how many of you played somebody that slowed the game down on you to the point, even though they might not have had a good enough, enough good talent, they still were in the game and had a chance to win. And how many of you that play slow have gotten way behind somebody at the beginning because of the way they play, and then you could never catch up because you're used to a different tempo. If you practice at a certain pace, whatever your style, then it's important that you be able to play that same pace during the course of the game. Now, how can you always dictate that? If you don't press, there's no way to dictate it. You, you cannot make the other team do something if you're only playing part-time. You can only hold the ball so long. And you, but you can slow the game down with the press the same as you can speed it up. So there, there is a way to press. There is some advantages for you, no matter which way you want to go. I'm going to go through, let me ask you this first. How many of you have five press offenses? Offense against the press. You don't, and no one has five. Okay, how about four? How about three? How about two? Now, here comes most of the hands. Now, most of the hands will say one with different options, right? Okay? All right, now, I want you to remember that because that's an important point. You see, if I'm a pressing team and I have four or five different ways to press and ways designed to take you away from what you want to do, for example, Just take this basic alignment right here. If you were attacking, if you're going this direction, going this way, and you're attacking this 2 2 1, where do you like to get the ball? Right here, don't you? And I don't blame you, because that's where you ought to try to get it. And if you can get it in there, what have, what have you done to my press? You pretty well beat it, assuming you can make a decent pass. Because once I, you put the ball here, that commits, we already bypassed two players, right? And we, so now, we make somebody come in here to guard this guy or to take him, and you're really vulnerable back down here, aren't you? Once they get the ball here. So if I'm going to press with this kind of a press, the first thing I've got to do is keep the ball where? Out of here, all right? Now, there are a lot of different ways to do that, which I'll go through. If this is where the ball is, if you're trying to get the ball, I can take that away from you. I can keep you from getting the ball in there. Now, you're going to have to do something else, aren't you? Okay, so with that in mind, here's what I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through some different ways with simple little changes that you can make your press do something real simple that will take away what the other team's trying to do in attacking it. And since I've got four, five, six different ways to do that, I'm going to, no matter what you do, I, I bet you I've got a way that I can make one little change and keep you from doing that. And that's the advantage of a pressing team. I can make a change in my press that will take away what you're trying to do with your press offense. All right, now let me show you. Let's, let's go ahead, Barbara, let's start. Now this is what we call our two. And in the two, it's our two, two, one is what it basically is. And what we're trying to do is make you dribble the ball into these areas. The obvious reason, because you can't throw this way or this way. So any trap that we can create here, gives the defense an advantage because you can't throw it backwards. So you've got to throw through two players, one here and one here. So anytime we can get you in these two areas, that's our primary trapping area. Now our secondary trapping area, go ahead, Robert, is down here. So if you, in fact, throw the ball down the face sideline out of the trap, the same man that was here is going to down pick, he's going to come down and trap here, and our, base, our protector back here is going to come out and trap. So we're actually going to trap you here, we're going to trap you here, you're on this side, we're going to trap you here, we're going to trap you here. Now the primary objective here, obviously, is to steal a ball, but we're also 
trying to keep you out of your set-in offense. We're trying to make you play, do something different than what you would normally do in practice. Or not let you set up and dump the ball into your seven-footer or whatever kind of situation that you're trying to create in your set offense. We're, going, we're trying to take that away from you. All right, move on. All right. Now, you see this, you see this area? We call this the gap area. And when you get the ball to this spot right here, this is the way we're going to be. This is what we're looking for, to be in this situation right here. And what we're trying to do is to, this two man who was up here on the press, as the ball comes down, the basic rule is when the ball gets in front of you, you get in front of the ball. Just that simple. You cannot be behind the ball. You've got to be in front of it. So if we can make you dribble into this area and set our trap, then the two man is in the gap, which we call the gap, physically here, but he's actually playing this pass. This pass here. Okay? The five man, as the three man comes up to set the trap, the five man is rotating, is cheating over here, the four man is cheating back, down into here so that if you try to throw it out the sideline, this five man has a chance to get it. If he doesn't get it and the ball comes down into this trapping area, now he's coming out, three's coming down. If he throws the ball down here, this three man's going to come down here, the five man's coming out here, and we got to, we're going to trap right here. Now, the two man now is, the one man now, the two man rotates back. He's got the weak side, and out here, and, and backside. He, he's going to take the high post area. The one man is coming down into this gap. Now this same gap that we just created here is now here. All right, three comes down, five comes here. Two's got high post and weak side. Four is going to come across. So what we have is the one man now in this gap area. So if you try, he's physically here, but he's playing this return pass. And this is a, a state of mind that you have to create. You have to, they, you have to keep the ball out of here with your one man, but you have to have him thinking to steal on this pass. The same as you do with the two man here. He's physically here, but if there's nobody in this area, he can cheat a little bit. And so when the double team is set, if the five man covers out here, he has to then throw the ball out of this trap, and every time he's got to throw through a double team, any time we can get him in this spot, then we have the advantage. And if every time we come down the floor, or half the time, or 30% of the time, we can create this, then we're going to get some steals. And all we want these two guys to do is to make this guy pick up the ball and to play with hands and to make him lob the ball or try to throw a bounce pass somewhere that takes long to get there. Primarily lob. We didn't see these guys jump once he's picked up his dribble. And if he has to lob the ball somewhere, then we got a chance to go get it. If these guys can get a deflection, we're in perfect position to get the steal. So you're physically in the gap, but you're playing here. When the trap's down here below, you're physically, the one man's in the gap, but he's actually playing this return pass here. And two's got this side, the top and the weak side, and four's got the low post. And we got the double team down here. So those are our trapping areas in the regular two preps. All right? You show the rotation of one and two after the pass down. Okay. One is right here. Run it back, Robert. One is here. He slides here. He slides here. I post and weak side. <coughs> Four comes across, five is here, three comes down here. So we got three and five in the double team, these two right here. Two has high post and weak side. One is physically here, but playing this return pass out here. All right? All right, go ahead. Okay, now let's start up front now. Now that we've You've seen what we're trying to do with the press. Now let's show you how we get there. This man plays a half a step in front and to the inside. He is actually playing to 
keep the pa help keep the path out of the middle. He's also in position here that if this man is going to dribble, he's going to have to dribble it up this way. He can't dribble to the inside, which is where we want him in. Come right through, dribble down that baseline. The man on the side of the ball, the two and the four and the one are actually trying to keep that ball out of the center, which is what we talked about earlier. That's where they want to get it against this press, so that's where we're going to do our best to keep it out of. If we can make him dribble down here, we call the three man or the four man if the ball's on the other side. We call this bluff and retreat, so that he's basically got any offensive player that's back in this area. He bluffs and re bluffs and he retreats in proportion, and as the ball comes across, once it gets to here, he then run and jump. So now there's our trap for him. And the two slid down in here. The four man who was here, he has backside. This five man, he's going to try to anticipate this pass here. He's going to try to stop the dribbler, get his hands up, jump, make this guy throw a lob pass so this guy has a chance to get it. Now, if you're using this kind of a trap, what does that tell you about your five man? It doesn't matter if he's five foot one. You can play a guard there. You can play a postman there, a point, it doesn't make any difference. Obviously, the better anticipator he is and the quicker he is, the better chance you have of getting steel. But he doesn't necessarily have to be a big man. And if, if you're trying to set these traps, then you don't really care what size this guy is because he's not really, in essence, protecting that basket anyway. Now, let's just, let me back it up just a little bit. <coughs> I'll crack it all the way up to the beginning of the press. <coughs> okay, now, you know that we're trying to make you dribble across that 10 second line so we can trap you right there, don't you? I mean, you've seen us play, you've scouted us, you know what this press is trying to do. So, if I can, I'm just assuming for sake of argument here that I can, by dipping this man and putting this guy in there, I can keep the ball out of the middle. Okay, now what are your alternatives? Is to reverse the ball or try to throw a ball. Okay, now let's assume that the ball comes in here. Go ahead. Alright, start it up the sideline. Alright, here he comes. Now stop it right there. Alright, now let's assume he throws the pass right here and reverses the ball. Okay, we have a reversal. All right, here we go. All right, okay, let's start it. Bring it back so we can see it from the beginning. See, this, this computer's quicker than you are, and I know it's quicker than me. All right, here's the ball. Okay, he goes step in bounds. All right, now reverse the ball. All right, we're going to go up and take this man because we want pressure on the ball. All right, he's reversed it to here. Okay. Now, the three-man was, anybody in this area, he was in a man-to-man -man situation unless he went deep, then he's a five-man responsibility. All right, so now, he's, he, this is the man he's going to be most conscious of. All right, All right so we, we threw the ball here. Now, he reverses it back across. All right, so now, here, this man drops back into the middle. Now, what has happened now? We've eaten up two or three seconds on the clock, haven't we? So now they've got probably seven seconds to do the same thing they had ten seconds. So in reality, the reversal didn't hurt us, did it? If anything, it helps us. Because now what we're doing, we've created more pressure because they have less time, and they get to advance the ball anywhere that will hurt us or beat our press. And they're certainly not any closer to the ten-second line than they were when we started. So we've actually gained a big advantage by keeping the ball out of the middle by the fact that you know that, that, you're, that you're going to get into that trapping situation, so you're going to reverse the ball. All right, so now this man is a half a step in front and playing pass into the middle. The three man just keeps it out of here. The one drops back into here. So this, we're right back where we started. All right, what do we have next? 
All right, now say he tries to take the ball down the other sideline. Stop it right there. <coughs> now, obviously, if he stops it here and reverses the ball to here, my one man is going to pick this ball up. He's going to take the ball and try to force him to bring it this way. The three man is also in this position. He's up in here when the ball is back here. He's not this deep. They are, my five man is really right here still. And the three man is really right here. And one's right here. All right, so once he, now if he takes it across, we're in exactly the same position we were, champs. All right, there's the trap setting. The one man is in the gap, but he's physically here. And he's playing this pass. <coughs> Five men playing the pass down the sideline. The three man rotates back. He's got the weak side. So he's physically in the gap playing this pass. If the pass comes on down the sideline, I wish we didn't do that on this. But if he throws it down here, now the four man in the five trap. The one's here. He, he backs into the high post area anywhere in here. The two slides down into this gap, but he's actually playing the return pass. So he's right back where you were before. Okay, let's go on, go on to the next one. Now, for sake of argument, I'm going to assume that I could not keep the ball out of the middle. That you were doing an excellent job getting the ball into your big man in the middle, flashing in there and turning and kicking it out and beating us down the floor. <coughs> what, let's say I take and move this four man into the middle. I move my five man up. Now the three and the five now are man to man play. Okay. On the inbounds, anybody down here, they're going to take man to man. The four man's going to stay between your middle man and the ball. All right, so we're right back. We, we made one little change in our press. We rotate him there and him here. All right, now bring the ball in back. All right, now we've already got a man here to keep this ball out of the middle, don't we? So that's no longer a concern of this man here. What he does now is rotate over and place head up on this dribbler right here. Right in this spot. Bring him over here, Robert. Yeah. Robert can't bring him over here. He can't get there. But anyway, that's what we're doing here. Now we rotate him to this spot right here. Okay, now what we're doing is we're going to put the pressure on this ball. If he wants to dribble it, that's fine. But we're going to try to force him back to the middle now. But let's assume that he's really good with the ball and he brings it up the sideline. Okay? Now the one still in this spot, watch him, as he comes across, once he crosses this 10 second line, this guy's job is now to get over here in front of him, make him pick up the dribble and the four man comes from behind in front. Before we rotated this man up, didn't we? It's now we take the guy that's on the ball, stop the dribbler here or step in front of him and as this guy stops and reverses here, the four comes out of the middle and the two takes the middle. So now what we've done is, is very simple. We've got you in the same position we had you before. <clears throat> Only we come from behind out of the middle of the trap rather than come up facing you in the trap. So we've got you back in the same spot we had you before. <clears throat> two man got the gap but he's playing this pass. <clears throat> he's already down here denying this ball down the sideline. If a team has a good three-point shooter and you're pressing and they like to throw it down the sidelines and shoot this shot, then it's a good press to use against them because you've got this guy that throws deep down here in a man-on-man -man situation, don't you? Right from the get-go. So there's no, you don't have to worry about you take that shot away from you. But you're also in position to get your same trap. Now we're going to try to force this man to the middle. All right, so if he wants to dribble the ball into the center here, that's fine. We'll sag this guy here. We'll double team him right here. If he wants to dribble to the middle, if he comes up the side, then we're going to do the same thing as we would cut him off, come from behind. If he goes in the middle, we'll double team right here. Now we've got this pass. Now he's going to have to either throw backwards or throw through somebody in his double team. And we've got man 
I'll man a situation here. The two on two, the deep man or man to man. If there's nobody there, you push up. So we will trap you here or here either one. But by doing this, what we've done is if we've taken away your offensive weapon. How many of you have an offensive press, a press offense that does not throw the ball in the middle? Got, I don't see any hands. There might be some where you don't, where you rotate play, just play on the side. But let's assume that that's the case. If you just attack on the perimeter, up the side, what are we trying to get you to do? Bring it up the side. So if your press offense doesn't throw it in the middle, you're doing exactly what we want you to do anyway. Because we want to put you in a trapping situation. If in fact you do, uh, you do try to get it in here, and I take that away from you, which is what I've done, now you have to have a different kind of press offense. You better be able to do something else. All right, let's go on to the next one. What do you do with, uh, with the balls in reverse? All right, here's the reversal. And then you use the back screen to skip past that. Frank, you come up and use the back screen on number one there. With who? Okay, if it's this guy over here, the three man has to man to man. If he back picks and he goes across, he just switches. <coughs> see, that's the beauty of having two guys back. You see what I'm saying? If, see, three, whoever's over in this place is the three man's anyway. So if he comes up here and back picks one, and this guy goes and you try to throw over, my three man just, he just automatically switches. The one's already got the guy comes up here and back picks, he's already there. He just yeah. waits right here, and when you try to throw over, he's got to be fair. How did you cover that the guy releasing off the screen on one? The screen's in there. Where, you here? Yeah. And then you've got the four man covering the middle. That middle man goes off the sideline, the guy has screen on one, releases right up to the middle of that gap. You're getting that. You throw it in here? Right. And you can run for it and clear it out. Your, your guy has to put the four man and put the guy in the middle. Right, this guy goes where? He goes where? Here? Yeah. All right, then my five man's got two over there. And he just, four man's right in here. I mean, that we like you to do that. I mean, I, I, all I can say to you is, is that that's what you have to make certain adjustments in your attack. Anybody, I can draw up here things that, you know, that you think will work, but it, it ha all comes down to execution. I don't know if you remember this. Some of you might, some of you older guys. When UCLA, back in the 60s, Start winning national championships with their 2-2-1 two, 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 press. They, Sports Illustrated did a, they interviewed the top 10 coaches or what they considered to be the top 10 coaches in the United States at that time and asked them how they would defense and how they would attack UCLA's 2-2-1 zone press. And they, all, and they had, I mean the whole Sports Illustrated was full a page after page of what these guys would do against the press. Obviously, none of them worked. They worked to a point, but that's the beauty of being a, a full-time pressing team. Because now, as, as soon as I press all the time, I learn to make adjustments. And, and the more customized become the pressing, the more visual and the better ability to anticipate that I have. So if, if, if you talk about that, this, this man, if he back picks here and he's coming here and the three man just stays here, if they try to throw it, he's going to get it. Now, this man here, when the ball's over there, he's going to slide down in here and you're going to have a tough pass through here. That four man, if he goes here, my five man might be back in here. He doesn't have to chase this guy. He just stays between him and the ball. I mean, you're going to have a hard time passing into the middle against this press. I don't care what, what you do. And that's our objective is to keep it out of the middle. So as we bring, make you bring it down the sideline, if you do that, you bring it down the sideline, the two's gonna cut you off, the four's coming from behind, the one's diving down in here, three's coming, I mean, that's, that's how we rotate. It's just like a defensive backfield. Obviously, you can design ways to beat this in certain situations, but as soon as you do that, that's why I ask you, how many press offenses do you have? Because if you make a change, that's being this, then I'll go to something else. And that's the advantage you have if you're a pressing team, that you have the ability, because you practice every day, to change your press. Okay? All right, let's go. What do we got next? Okay.
Okay, now, a lot of people take the ball out of bounds with their best ball handle against the zone type press, so that when the ball comes in bounds, you can reverse the ball to him, and he in turn will find the open man and beat the press because he's really a great ball handler. So if we're facing that kind of a situation, what we do is we run, like we might be in a 2-1, we'll say 2-1 up. So as the pass comes to here, the two flashes up here, and he denies the ball back to this man. Now whoever you have here with the ball had better be a good ball handler because he's now in a situation where we've got you matched up. These two were man to man. He's got the man in the middle. He denied the ball here, he's playing him head up. <coughs> so if you throw it into a big man here so that you can throw it over the press, everybody else is now man to man and if we don't let him throw it back to this man, now you've got to handle the ball with, the, with someone you didn't want. You were using him to get the ball inbound. By now if you have two guards there, that's fine, you're still the same. I play arms distance and straight up. And my job now is to control this dribbler as best I can. And any time out of this, if he tries to dribble, we're going to be in a position where we can run and jump you no matter which way you go, and then rotate up and try to anticipate, get a reflection, get the hand on the ball. And so we're, by running what we call two, we have two one, and up means that we're going to deny the ball back to the guy that's hurt us. So if that's your press offense here, to get it back to him and him beat somebody or kick it off or hit the open man, then we're going to take that away from him. Now you've got to go to another press offense. How many have you got? The advantage is always with the pressure. Unless, you, once you design something that will beat it, then we have the ability to make a change because it's something we practice full time. It's our primary defense. That's what we do. All right, let's go ahead. Well, All right, now, yeah, question? On just right back there, if you have someone deep behind three, yeah, okay, don't you have to move three back like for your retreat? Sure, he's going to take anybody that comes out here man to man. Okay, now my only other question is, doesn't four have to be a pretty good athlete to cover that much area left in the middle then? One. Now, all he's doing is taking, staying between this man and the ball so you can't throw it to him. But if three goes back to retreat deep, yeah. what if the man close to the 10 second line cuts to the sideline? You mean this guy? Right over in here. This guy here? Yeah. Well, he's got him, man. If he stays between him and the ball, what you might do it. You might get away with it once. Now, the next time this guy's going to know that he's coming over here, he's got to throw through this man, doesn't he? That's why he's now head up instead of over here inside, because we're not worried about this pass anymore, are we? We're only now worried about this pass. So now that, that makes this man conscious. This guy starts here, he just comes with him. Now, you might get away with it once, but once you've done it once, see, we have the ability to adjust. He's got this guy, and all we have to do is say, you know, go with him. If he hasn't, if you haven't done it, he's probably done it in practice that way many times anyway. But this man has got to throw the ball through, or run it over, or throw a bounce pass, and, and this guy right here, all he has to do is go with it. Now you've got, we've got the best of both worlds. If you're quick enough and you dribble into here, we'll run and jump you here. Five man will rotate up, he might rotate back, or he might rotate in the middle, depending on where your other players are. So it's a, it's, it's a matter of recognition and repetition. In practice, you set up drills to cover these situations, just like you do in, in any other thing you do. You break down your press, and you, we work some days with just the two and the one. We just take those three guys up there, and we work on all the things that you can do against that. So that then when I tell them, if they don't recognize it, at a timeout or something, I'll show them. Or if a team hurts us the first time we play them with a certain thing, we show it to them on the film and say, now how can we cover this out of our press? And then we, we work on it. But we set up drills to cover all the situations. And if he dribbles into here and beat, so this guy's denying, he, if he makes a penetration, we'll double team him here. If this is your ball handler, or if this is your ball handler, if these are your two ball handlers, even if you get it out of our double team to this guy, I mean, how many ball hammers have you got? If you got all good ball hammers, well, you probably don't win anyway. Because <laughs> that's the name of the game. All right.
sometimes. Make sure you can run better than they can, or you've got more endurance or whatever. That's a judgment you as a coach have to make. But our perspective on the thing is, if we want to make you run and play at a faster tempo, we're going to do something to deny you the inbounds pattern. Now, I'll go back to the beginning of the denial. All right, here we are. This is, we were in 2D before. Here's 2-1-D. We got 2 one and we're in our denial on the front, right? Okay, now in this thing, what we're trying to do here, no matter what you're doing here, we're just, we're trying to keep the ball out of this, these two guys' hand. There's three. Three and five are in man-to-man -man situation. If your man's over here, he's over here in denial. If well, he's over here, he's over here in denial. All right, what we're trying to do here is to, be three on two against the guys you're trying to get it inbounds against. So if I front these two and you try to have to throw over, I've got this man sitting here playing, he's my anticipator, my quick guy, he's in there playing pick level. And if this guy is moving his feet, doing a job and has his hands up, he's got to throw a lob pass. Same with here. And so what we're what we're trying to do now, now you've got two options, or three really. If in fact they get the ball inbounds, then you can do anything you want. You can trap the inbounds right away. Let's say this guy makes a quick move and they throw him the ball here. But, but as he moves, my one's moving, here comes my four, we can double team this guy right here. This guy can dive back in here to the middle, anticipate this, or the log pass over out of the double team, whatever they want. But what we're doing, we're trapping every inbounds pass you make. Okay? If we don't want to trap, and he gets the ball in here. We want to move around, play him head up, and we can go right back into our 2-1-2, two, two, try to force you down the sideline, cut him off with the one, bring the four from behind, and go right back into our trap the other way. See, so it really doesn't matter. I have that option. You don't know which one I'm going to use. Am I, I mean, I can do it either way. It doesn't matter. I can stay straight man-to-man -man once the ball comes in bounds. Or I can go back to our 2-1-2, two, two, or I can go straight to a 2. It doesn't make any difference. I can rotate this guy back, bring him back here, and I 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And I can force you down here and run and jump with the 1-3. Because I know how to do all those things. I can do it any way I want. Question? Uh, you're 3 and 5, and they're playing head up, or they're playing denial? Or they're playing denial. Man, they're playing on the side. One hand in front, one behind. Just like that. Man standing right, he'd be right here, I'm right there. And we're going to challenge you to throw the long pass on us. Because that's what we're trying to do is speed it up anyway. But the beauty of it is, if you have the advantage initially, if it does come in, you can stay man to man. You can trap the inbounds pass. You can go two up. Or you can go two one D up if you want. You can, let's say he throws the ball in here, he can fire up and deny it back to your ball handler right here. Okay, we play him head up over here with the ball, or the four man, they can double team, deny it here, make him throw to this guy. This guy anticipates, this guy anticipates, I mean, there's a, you can do a dozen different things. It just depends on you and your personnel and what you're trying to accomplish. But the beauty of it is you can change it at any time, at a free throw, at a timeout, and a ball out of bounds. And once you've taught your players what 2-1-D means, or 2-up, or 2-1, or whatever it is you're using, then, then it's, and you practice making the changes. You do it in practice. When you have your five on, work on your five on five. I'll stand, I'll even, we'll even tell the other team. I'll just call it out. I'll say, okay, we're gonna go 2-1-D, and we're gonna double team the inbounds pass. So no matter who they throw it into now on the inbound pass, we're going to double team them with the format. Oh, we don't care, you know, what you do. We're, that's what we're going to do. Now I'll say go 2-1-D and force the ball up the side, sideline. <coughs> okay, now they know that we're going to try to trap here or here. And they're going to do it if he dribbles it up. That means when I say that, what does this one man do different? Instead of playing head up, he moves to the inside, doesn't he? Now we're going to invite you to dribble up here. <coughs> Three-man.
man's got his man back here. As he comes across, the one's going to get in front of him, and the four men's coming from behind. Two men in here, five men back here. So we may, we're pressing the same press. We, we look like we're 2 one P up here, but we go right back to the zone and the traps across the 10 second line, or we can trap the inbounds pass, or we can just stay man to man. Depends on who, if they throw the ball into, they put a big guy up here to get the ball inbounds, we'll just match up. Now we'll make this guy dribble, which is usually to your advantage if you make somebody else handle deny it back to somebody else. Question. What do you have to do different if three and five men are lined up in the middle of the floor, say in the 10 second line and the top of the key? Like here? Yeah. You don't have to do anything different. I mean, they're still man to man. You just move them right up in here with them. You still got your four man here. He's not going to throw it in there. I mean, it, you don't do anything different. All right, let's go. Let me cover one more. Remember this situation where he picks here? He comes off and then he rolls? All right, let's go to the next one. All right? Now, we were in 2 1 D. Now we're going to go to what we call flop. All right, now what? We took the four man over here and moved him up here. Now he turns his back. He doesn't watch this ball. He's watching these plays. We still have one, two, three, four, five against four. Now the three and the five man are man to man instead of the three to four with the five protector. We got three and five here, man to man. And here we are. Now watch. If he comes in here and picks, did we show that? All right, he comes in here and screams, right here. All right, this man comes off, which makes that one man switch. Now we just double team, the four man stays between him and the ball, and the two man now plays the lob over. So we still, if this is your ball hammer, and we're trying to keep him out from handling the ball, we're going to double team him. So when he picks and tries to roll, my four man's standing right there denying the ball to him and the two man's, and we're done to double team him. So and a lot of people do this. They do this type of screen and roll to get it inbounds, especially against man-to-man -man pressure. Well, when you're in any kind of a D situation, you are in essence man-to-man -man on the inbounds, aren't you? Whether you have a protector or not, you're still man-to-man -man denying the inbounds ball. So once it comes, so this, if you're having a problem keeping the screen and roll stuff from hurt you, you just move him up, or maybe move this guy up, move your five man here, depends on your personnel. And now we're going to double team the guy they're trying to get it to. And if he wants to throw over, he's watching this guy, this guy's sitting back here, he's trying to anticipate If he's clear down here, that's a different situation. You just have to make this guy alert. But we practice every day what we call recovery where we'll put them in every situation conceivable, throw the ball over to somebody running out. And then we practice covering down, telling the back people who to take with the point, and we work on recovery drills every day. Because the real secret in being a good pressing team is not so much what you're doing, but the fact that you can do it without getting burned at the other end. If every time you press, they get the ball through the beach at the other end, and obviously you press isn't good enough to use it. So the secret is not just being a pressing team, but being good enough at what you're doing that you can make the other team make changes, and in turn be able to recover to the point where you don't give up something at the other end, and depending on what they're doing to attack you. So what you want is, is a series of presses where you make a little change, like this one, because they were hurting us on the pick and roll, we take the four, now we call it flop. 2D, we're in 2D, and we flop him up, move the five men up, now we're going to double team the, the guy you're trying to get it to. So now we can make you throw it to somebody else. Well, in practice, you didn't have to do that. You got it into that guy on the screen and roll. But now I take that away from you. And that's, the, that's what I, we try to do in our press. No matter what you're doing, We've already got a way that we practice that takes away what you're doing. Now, we're going to make you change. And if you have to change more than once, chances are you're not going to be, your kids aren't going to know what to do because you're going to have to take timeouts. We're going to get it. See, this game is played in spurts. 
beauty of basketball is it only takes one good spurt in order to, let me tell you something that I believe in. It's human to error. And pressure causes error. Example, if you're in a typing class, you type 40, 50 words a minute, you read, you're typing off page seven. You're typing like crazy, you're doing good. Now your teacher says to you, now we're gonna have a test on page seven. Okay? So now you get one minute to see how many words you can type. Now, tell me what the result's gonna be. You're gonna go faster, aren't you? And you're gonna make more mistakes. Coach Wooden always used to say, be quick, but don't hurry. Because when we get you to hurry, <coughs> you're going to make a lot more mistakes than you are at your own pace. And that's our objective, is to make you hurry. You're playing in a $100 uh, automatic press golf match. You're on the third hole, you got a three-foot putt routine. Straight in putt, you knock it in the hole. Now you've got the same putt on six, same putt on 11, and you come down to 17 or 18. And now, instead of $100 on the match, you're playing for $1,100. Is that same three-foot putt easier or harder? You got it. It's harder. It's a lot tougher to do that same thing and do it well because why? Because as the match went along, the pressure increased in accordance with the amount of money. Well, the same thing's true in basketball. As the game comes closer to the end, Every mistake gets accentuated, doesn't it? You make seven turnovers in the first half, but you make one turnover at the end of the game and you get beat, what does everybody say? You threw that ball away and we got beat because you made a turnover. Well, they made seven in the first half. Nobody talks about those, do they? It's not what happens early, it's what happens at the end. So what we're trying to do as coaches is to put enough pressure on the other team so that by the end of the game, the pressure is built. It's, it's, it increases. You saw that golf match that they were playing last week? Where, I mean, what was the first prize in kite money? $450,000? Now, you can talk about pressure. Now, I mean, this is near as much pressure as Lee Trevino would say, real pressure is playing a $5 Nassau with only a dollar in your pocket. <laughs> And there's something to be said for that. But the point I'm trying to make is really very simple. The idea, by being able to make changes in your press, what you do is you keep constant pressure on them. Whatever they do, you take it away. That's your job as a coach. It's the same, can be the same thing in your set in defense. If they're hurting in a man to man, you try a zone or a matchup, or you try to do something else, don't you? You do the same thing with the press. You don't abandon the press because they burn you a time or two. What you do is you use your head and you practice on whatever you need to do to take something away, whatever they're doing, you change your press. Now, how can you do that? The only way you can do it is through practice. You can't go into a game and say, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to change our press. Now, if you have practice, you can forget it. Because even if you practice it, sometimes they screw it up, don't they? Because that's game slipping. That's what pressure does to you. It's easy in practice. You know, when there's no, I've got kids, same as you, that play great in practice and, and can't do anything in the game. And then you've got kids just reversed, don't you? That are terrible practice players, but when the game, when the tip-off goes up, they play, don't they? And we all have those kind of situations. So what we're trying to do is to make you change and take away what you do and make you do something else. And there's nothing more frustrating as a player than going into a timeout with the coach and him not knowing what to tell you and you not being able to do it because you didn't practice that change. So that's what we're doing with our press. We're taking our press, we, we make a little change here, we take this away from you because that's what you're attacking us with. We take it away and now you have to do something else. You have to make an adjustment. And then that's when we get those spurts. When we make a change and take something away you're trying to do, we get a little spurt, we might make two or three baskets in a row. Now we've got all the edge because, you know, if I didn't press,
is that we have practiced the changes. We make you take away from you what you're trying to do so that you now have to make the adjustments. And if you, the better you make them and the smarter your kids are, the better trained they are, obviously, if they're good enough and you've got four or five different changes you can make, and that's why I asked you that question initially. Well, because I know you don't have time to have five press offenses. But if playing me, my primary game is pressing, then I have the edge over you because I have enough ways to change that I can take away whatever you want to do. And when I do that, I have the edge. How many of you have been to Las Vegas? Or Atlantic City? <laughs> How do you think they build those big, beautiful places? with a little bitty edge, little bitty edge. You can go in there and play on a crap table where the odds are less than 1% in the house's favor. And they still build those big casinos, don't they? Why and how? It's real simple, because you make a lot of mistakes. Their edge isn't that big if everybody went in there and played perfect, is it? They'd have a tough time supporting those places. But the reality of it is, it doesn't happen that way. Why do you think they have those pretty girls running around with nothing on, feeding you those that alcohol? <laughs> so that you lose a little bit here and you make a lot more mistakes and you're a lot more risque. I mean, that's how they build those places, is that force you to make mistakes. Now, you don't have to break it, but you still have to play perfect to be within that 1%. All those big, beautiful chandeliers they got in there got to be paid for somehow. And it was with same principle, a little bitty edge. So going into every game, that's what you're looking for, is have an edge. Something you can do that the other team can't handle. And then you've got a chance to even beat teams that aren't as good as you, is if you've got that little edge. So that's what, really, what we're looking for as coaches, is a little edge, somewhere. I like to use big guards, because most people use a point guard. Most point guards are little. I'll run my big guards in there and post them up and throw them the ball all night. Now, my center might not be bigger than yours, but I'll bet you one of my guards are. So that's an edge for me, isn't it, if I can do that? Well, that's what we all need. That's how you win basketball games is with a little bitty edge. There's no big, magnificent uh, theory about basketball. It's a simple game. If you have an edge the other guy doesn't have, that gives you what, that's what you need. Now you got to capitalize on it, and that's what we try to do. That's why we press. And that's why we fall back into switching man-to-man, -man, not a zone, because we want the continuous pressure on you. And that's what we get. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Sometimes I do a bad job. Sometimes my players don't make the baskets. Sometimes the other team's just better. But in reality, over the long haul, the consistency in your winning, assuming equal talent, is going to come by the job you do. And if you have the advantage, then you're going to win more than the other guy did. You win more than the other guy, you probably still get your job back the next year. That's what we look for, because we all love what we're doing. We don't want out of it, do we? Well, most of us are trying to get in heavier, <coughs> trying to get to maybe the level that we are, or Michigan or Michigan State. And that's the challenge. So the better job you do, the better prepared your players are, the better chance they have of winning.